All right, I actually misspoke at the end of the previous lecture when I said that we were ready to get into theory of deformation. We've actually got one more lecture on some mathematical preliminaries. We need to talk about vector fields and differentiation of vector fields, which is going to, which is going to lead us into something called the displacement gradient. So let's talk about uh, this topic just a little bit. So many engineering quantities can be represented by vectors. For example, the displacement of a particle from point A to point B can be represented by a vector, and this would be the displacement of that particle. Now, in theory of elasticity and in continuum mechanics, we're not interested typically in the displacement of a single particle. We're often interested in the displacement field of an entire object or body. So let's say for a continuous body, a vector field can represent the displacement of every point on the body. So for a basic example, let's say we have a square plate, and this is what it looks like in the original position. We do some things and we stretch it and squish it and do different things, and, and maybe at the end then it has some kind of shape maybe like this. Now, if I were to draw all the vectors that are in this, then it would look pretty messy. So I'm just going to draw a few of them, and uh, particularly the ones at the corner. So this point right here goes to this point over here. I'll try to I'll try to hit that point. This corner point moves to this corner point. And this one over here, move to the one in back. And this one over here is moving to this spot right here. And so you can imagine that every single point on that body is mapping to some other point on the deformed body. And there are all kinds of these displacement vectors. And they change. Uh, they change along the x-direction, they change along the y-direction, their components change, and there are different rates of change in all the different directions. In general, this could be in three dimensions. It might even be easier to see if I were to redraw this kind of figure as uh, maybe a rod being bent, and uh, we only have like a, a one one mapping, one set of lines. So let me do that. All right. So if we look at this uh, in this original bar here on the left, and maybe the deformed bar, if we look up and down the bar, maybe select a few points, can look at this mapping to where they go after the bar has been deformed. And this would give us a vector field, a displacement field, for this bar. Now this field is in the x-direction but we can definitely tell that there's some sort of change happening as we move up in the y direction in this bar. 
And so we call these displacement vectors Q. Uh, like our book does, or a lot of people just use the symbol U for displacement, and we will we will use both okay, at different times. Our book actually changes from Q to U uh, part way through. All right, so if we want to think of a vector field function. put a little squiggle underneath that to denote the vector field function. It's a function of position x, y, and z. And when I put in the coordinate point x, y, and z, out comes a vector. Okay, the, the red lines I have there would be an example of a vector field. If I put in the x, y, z position of this point, then I get a vector that's of this length. If I put in the x, y, z position of that point, then I get a different vector that is of that length and in that particular direction. Now we can talk about things called steady fields. So if this field function is not a function of time, it's called study. Or sometimes stationary. But if it is a function of time, so I can write this explicitly, x, y, z, and t, then in general it could be unsteady. or non-stationary. If you've taken a class in fluid mechanics, such as AEM 500, you might have dealt with uh, potential fu functions for potential flow. So we can define a potential function as a vector field that is determined from the gradient of a scalar point function. In fluid mechanics that may represent a velocity field. And in other fields it may represent different types of, of fields, but the same idea is that, that represents a potential function. Taking the appropriate derivatives of that yields a vector and yields a vector field. Okay, F the, is the potential function, and then in this case, uh, if that is also the case, then Q is the potential field. Okay, so just some terms there, a little bit of uh, algebra or uh, differentiation there, some definitions. All right, uh, let's take a look at the differentiation of a vector. We'll get into vector fields in more detail, but if we just look at a single vector, if we have uh, maybe a vector r, use the same symbols as our book, and we have some derivative of it, some increment, and that increment does not necessarily need to be collinear with the vector r. It doesn't have to be parallel to that. Then the result will be through vector addition over here, r plus dr. And in general, if we were to look at the magnitude of r plus dr, you can kind of see this through 
our triangle inequality that the magnitude of r plus dr is going to be less than or equal to the magnitude of r plus the magnitude of dr. And just as a reminder, vectors can change in magnitude and direction. All right, let's look at things that might change with time. All right, so let's consider a function q, capital Q, which is a scalar u times a vector r. And both of those, uh, u and r, are both functions of time. If we wanted the increment of q added to q, we can find that from u plus delta u and r plus delta r. If we divide both sides by a small time increment and solve for delta q by delta t, we expand out the right hand side. We have ur is delta ur plus u delta r plus some higher order terms, delta u delta r. And if we take the q, which is equal to u over r, to the other side, we have a minus ur. And then everything on this right-hand side is divided by delta t. If we get rid of the higher order terms, and uh, the first and last term cancel out, then delta q by delta t can be represented here as u delta r by delta t plus delta u times r delta t or in the limit just write this way as delta t goes to zero in the limit We have the derivative with respect to time of the vector field function q equal to, let's write it this way, the vector field r times du by dt plus u times dr by dt. Uh, in other words, we get back our product rule differentiation. All right, let's represent a vector in a basis and see uh, what that looks like. All right, so previously we've just been taking a look at uh, the vectors as if they're these quantities that exist as vectors, but we know when we want to work problems, a lot of times we want to express these vectors in certain basis, uh, bases, like our XYZ coordinate system, certain coordinate systems. So our vector r, we can represent as a set of scalars times our unit basis vectors. So we have ri e hat i. If we expand this out by our index notation, we have a vector that has a scalar component r1 and a vector e hat 1 and so forth that I'm going to go ahead and write down. If we take a derivative of this then, dr, taking the derivative of the scalar component and the vector. Then we do 
uh, something similar as what we've done before. Basically, use our product rule. We have the components times the derivative of the basis vectors, and then the derivative of the components times the basis vectors. Now, for us, our unit basis vectors are fixed and they're orthonormal. They are not evolving over time. So this term goes away and we're left with dr is equal to the derivative of the components times our unit basis vectors. If we need a derivative with respect to time, we can do the same sort of analysis. And again, our unit orthonormal basis vectors are not evolving over time. So that term will go away. And we can rewrite this as the time derivative of each of these components. And either the e hat 1, 2, and 3 or the i, j, and k directions. So we can explore some things, um, some more derivatives with respect to time in a little bit more detail. We've seen this really already, but um, if we have a scalar point function, uh, now we're calling it capital Q, again, we're just kind of sticking with the notation in our particular book that we're using. Maybe not my favorite notation, but to avoid any kind of confusion, we're going to go ahead and stick with it. I don't have a squiggle underneath my Q, so that means it's a scalar point function. We can talk about our total differential. And if it also involves time, then we have an added component here, partial derivative of q with respect to time, dt. So it can also evolve in time. We can use our index notation to more compactly write this. So it's a partial of q sub i, oh, excuse me, partial of q with respect to x sub i. dxi. That's three terms right there. And then the fourth term, partial of q with respect to time, dt. If we want the derivative with respect to time, then we can express it in this way. Now if we look at this closely, the, the third term here, let me circle it. Third term over from the far left. That's the change in position with respect to time. That's velocity. Okay, so if we want to call our velocity components, 
v, then we can rewrite this as dq by dt is equal to my, our velocity components, v sub i, partial of q with respect to x sub i, plus partial of q with respect to time. Now, this term here, we've seen that before, that's related to our gradient. And we know that when we have this kind of situation where we have the summation of two terms, we can think of a velocity vector in this gradient vector term. So this is another common way to write this expression as velocity vector v dotted with del q plus partial derivative of q with respect to time. We can look at vector fields and differentiation with respect to time. So if we take uh, capital Q, put a squiggle underneath it, now we have a vector field. We can look at the derivative of that vector field with respect to time. And in a similar way, we can get partial derivative of that field with respect to x dx by dt in similar terms for the y in the z direction. plus that change in q with respect to time, that partial derivative. Now again, if we denote dxi by dt as velocity components, we can express this as partial derivative of that vector field q with respect to position xi with the summation with velocity and then the partial derivative q with respect to time. Again, it's kind of like a, a dot product of velocity with the gradient operator whose result is operating on Q. Now a lot of this notation, again, you'll, you'll see a lot in fluid mechanics. You also may find this in large deformation solid mechanics, like uh, large deformation plasticity analysis. Now while we're here, we might as well talk about the curl of a vector field. Again, if you're familiar with fluid mechanics, it has something to do with the vorticity. We can define the curl of the vector field as the cross product between the gradient operator and that vector field Q. Now we know how to do this operation either using a matrix type approach and, uh, or also using our permutation tensor. Let's uh, Let's do a permutation tensor since we haven't seen that in a little while. So we have the first vector, which is an operator, the partial of something here, nothing there yet, with respect to spatial position, xi. We have the second vector, the qj components of that. We have the permutation tensor, epsilon ijk. And then we have our unit basis vector e hat k. And since we have these three repeated indices, i, j, and k are all repeated, then uh, we end up with a triple summation.
Now a lot of terms in this triple summation are going to be equal to zero. Anytime we evaluate this and we have a repeated index, the permutation tensor goes to zero. Remember an even permutation results in a plus one. And an odd permutation represents, uh, gets evaluated as a minus one. So if we were to evaluate this out, the curl, del cross q of a particular vector, in terms of its components, let's see, would be partial derivative of q sub j with respect to xi, e hat, uh, sorry, I need to evaluate these out with numbers, 1, 2, and 3, epsilon i, j, k, epsilon 1, 2, 3, that would go to plus 1, plus partial derivative of q, 1, i, j, k, this would actually be, let me, let me straighten out my subscripts here. i is 1, j is 2, and k is 3, so that would go to plus 1. And if we have 2, 1, 3, that would be partial derivative of q1 with respect to x2, permutation tensor 2, 1, 3, e hat 3. This one goes to minus 1. And then we have our remaining terms. I'm just going to go ahead and write those down. Partial derivative of q, uh, let's do x2, q3, e hat 1, permutation tensor 2, 3, 1, that evaluates to be plus 1, plus partial derivative of q2 with respect to x3, e hat 1, permutation tensor 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, that evaluates out to be minus 1. And then lastly, if I get all these in here, the last thing we need is x3, Q2, Oop, we already done that one. X3, Q1, E hat 2, permutation tensor 3, 1, 2, that evaluates out to be a positive one. And then, now the last one. x1, q3, that partial derivative, e hat 2, permutation tensor 1, 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, evaluates out to be minus 1. So we add all these things together and we got the curl of q. All right, so now let's talk about the gradient of a displacement field. Displacement field is a is a vector field, and we've actually done some of the math on this already. Um, but this, if we talk about the gradient of a displacement field, a displacement field is pretty easy to to grasp. We've we've drawn some pictures about displacement fields previously, and we'll kind of keep those pictures in mind. And I might even call one back up and paste it on onto here. Let's talk about the gradient in general. We talked about first the gradient of a vector, uh, excuse me, vec of a uh, scalar function. So if we have del f, which is a function of position, then what we do is we take a partial derivative of that function f with respect to each of the spatial coordinate directions. So partial of f with respect to xi, partial f with respect to yj, 
in a partial of f with respect to z k. Again, using our index notation, we can write it more compactly in this form. So what we get is a three-component vector. And its components are the rates of change. In particular, I guess you could say spatial rates of change. All right, now suppose we have a vector field. Now, we're going to use A at first. We'll probably switch this to U when we talk about displacement. But if we have a vector field, that vector field can be expressed in terms of components in our basis. And those components, A1, A2, and A3, can all change spatially. They can all be functions of x, y, and z themselves. Now we can think of the gradient of a vector field. Now the gradient itself, it, it's the rate of change in three different directions and we have three different components. So the gradient of this vector field will have nine components. All right, let's make a little more room. There's some different ways to write this notation. If we use the vector field Q, we can say the gradient of Q or the displacement field Q. Uh, some books will use this notation, del comma Q. Or we can think of it this way, partial derivative of Q with respect to Xi, E hat I. Now, if Q is a displacement field, then we can have its components, say U, like U, J, E hat J. And so when we evaluate the gradient of Q, We can think of it this way. We're taking the partial derivative with respect to xi of the uj e hat j. And then we have the e hat i right out here. Okay, So q is uj e hat j. That just gets substituted right in here. <clears throat> now by our rules of differentiation, by our product rule, We can take, in this product, we can take the, the second term times the derivative of the first. And we have this e hat i right out here, plus the first term times the derivative of the second. Now, again, for a fixed orthonormal basis system, these things aren't changing, so that term's going to go away. And so we can say that the gradient of Q it's going to be equal to a partial derivative of uj with respect to xi 
and then we have this thing here e hat i e hat j now there is a double summation on this so that's how we get our nine terms let's go ahead and expand this out and I want to make a point about the basis that we're working in So along the first set of components here, I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to x1, and I'm incrementing the subscript on u. And uh, now on the second row, I'm going to fix second uh, partial derivative on x, I'm going to fix that as 2, and then I'm going to increment the subscript on u. two and three okay and then I have one more row I'm going to write down where I have partial u1 with respect to x3 e hat 1 e hat 3 well I guess I put the the x first here let me be careful with this this term uh, the first one needs to go with the term on the on the x So this would be 3 and 1. Then we have e hat 3, e hat 2. And then finally, e hat 3, e hat 3. Right, let me uh, clean a little bit of uh, space up here so we can have some room for some, for some other things. Okay, and I do need to fix one more subscript. This one should have been uh, 2 and 1. And I think I have them all now. So I have 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3. All right, so this thing that we have here is kind of an interesting looking thing. We're very used to vectors, and remember our vector A we expressed as component a1 e hat 1 plus component a2 e hat 2 plus component a3 e hat 3 and we said that e hat 1 2 and 3 were the basis um, for our our vectors well this thing that we have here we really haven't talked about this operation but this e hat 1 e hat 1 it's not a dot product it's not a cross product it's actually going to be called a tensor product. Uh, but the components, the weights in front of these terms, are the components of a second order tensor. And this thing, this e hat 1, e hat 1, e hat 2, e hat 1, all that, those form the basis of our second order tensor in the same way as the three vectors form the basis for our vectors. Now, when we've picked a particular basis, we get a particular set of components. If we change bases, we are going to change components. Just like with a vector, a vector has a certain, certain set of things that don't depend on our choice of coordinate system, its magnitude and direction. The components of this creature, the second order tensor, 
has certain characteristics that do not depend on the choice or orientation of our coordinate system. And a lot of this course will be spent exploring what those things are. Things like principal strains, principal stresses, and so forth will be things that we can get from our components of our tensor that can be expressed in any particular coordinate system. Let's talk a little bit more about this basis for second order tensors. Okay. So that thing, um, even though it's got nine terms all added together, it's not a scalar, not in the same way that three components at times are unit basis vectors aren't a scalar when we represent a vector. And the operation between the e hat 1 and e hat 2 and so forth is not a scalar or a vector product. Uh, it's called a tensor product. And the way we represent a tensor product, we can represent it this way. e hat i cross with a circle around it, e hat j. If we thought of having a vector of unit basis vectors, e hat 1, e hat 2, e hat 3, then this product would be the same as if we did a column of these multiplied by a row of these same things. And in that case, we would get a matrix. I'll go ahead and, and write this out with all these terms. But as you will see, we end up with nine different terms. And we really won't write this out this way really ever again. Uh, once we get so used to working with an orthonormal basis, we'll just know that when we have a set of components, that they're really multiplied by these basis vectors. Now, in a general class in continuum mechanics, you might talk about things called covariant and contravariant components. Um, the, the nice thing about using an orthonormal basis is that we don't have to worry about those different types of components of tensors. We're only going to have one set of components to really worry about for our orthonormal basis, and that will be the components that go along with these, and uh, we'll draw a matrix of components that are the weights in front of these terms on our unit orthonormal tensor product basis vector, uh, uh, tensor basis. Okay. So here we have a 3 by 1, we have a 1 by 3, and we end up with a 3 by 3. So the weights in front of these terms then will be the components of our tensor, just in the same way that the weights in front of our unit basis vectors for vectors are the components of a vector. Now in general, if you want to take two vectors and do their tensor product, then you would have a setup like this. Now I realize these are components of vectors and what I have written before are not exactly components of vectors. But if we take these components and multiply them out this way then we can do a tensor product of these two vectors A and B. And the tensor product can be defined by its action on another vector. 
So U tensor product V. Okay, that's a three by three matrix that we have right there. Acting on a vector W. Turns out that if we have these three vectors, then that would give us the same result as V dot W multiplying by the vector U. Okay, so this is a three by three. This would be a three um, by one. The result is a three by one. This is a three by one dotted with a three by one. That gives us a scalar times a three by one. And so this gives us a three by one, gives us a matrix. All right, so another way then, finally, we can say that the gradient of a displacement field Q can be given by the components partial of UJ with respect to XI. And then we have this basis, uh, we're going to write it this way, E hat J tensor product E hat I. And again, we don't very often talk about this basis, but we will very often talk about these components. And since I and J are free indices, if we just looked at this term, and there are nine components that we have to deal with. We have the partial derivative of the displacement component one in the x, y, and z direction, and partial derivative of the displacement component two with respect to x, y, and z, and displacement component three with respect to x, y, and z. Gradients of displacement fields are not the only place that we'll see second order tensors. Uh, these will pop up in different ways, uh, but this is kind of useful at this point to kind of introduce the subject. Now there are certain transformation laws that must apply in order for something to be a tensor, and we will get to those and we will um, go into detail about that uh, pretty soon once we look at transformations and uh, get into those kind of details. All right, so now with this background, we can begin to take a look at our theory of deformation.